Welcome to the Jackson Rudolph Podcast. I am your host, Jackson Rudolph, with my co-pilot this evening, my lovely wife, Gabrielle. And this is episode 112 of the Jackson Rudolph Podcast. I'm going to start by apologizing to you guys. I didn't announce it, but we just didn't release a show last week uh, because I had a medical school exam this, what was that, Tuesday? Yeah, because Monday was Labor Day. Yep. So my exam yeah, was Tuesday. Yeah. I got scores back yesterday. And everything went well, so that was good. Uh, but he because... did better than well. He's being very <laughs> humble. He got A's on both of his exams. Okay, in okay, school, that's so... enough. That's enough. Okay, okay. I had to brag uh, a little bit. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, but because I was studying, I did not do a podcast last week. So here we are. We're making up for it. And this is your third time on the show? Yeah, this is my third time. Okay. So uh, this is our first time doing the show together as newlyweds. Of course, now that we are living together, you'll probably see a little bit more of Gabrielle on the show. Uh, and we're just going to have some fun tonight. We, I had a couple of outlets on my Instagram account, on Facebook, uh, where people could submit questions ahead of time. But this is designed to be a live Q&A as well. So for those of you that are tuning in right now, drop those questions down in the comments, especially for our Black Belt Magazine audience. You guys have probably seen this show pop up on your feed before. You know it's a sport karate show. You know that I talk about sport karate. But not only is Gabrielle going to talk about some sport karate tonight, but we're going to kind of peel back the curtain a little bit. Gabrielle is the one responsible for a lot of what you guys see on the Black Belt Magazine social media accounts, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all the different socials. Gabrielle is behind a lot of that with the help of somebody who's more behind the scenes and Cody McCart. So Cody, we're going to give you a big shout out. Uh, you guys can follow Cody's journey starting Tom Sudo class in Chastity Scarberry at Century Headquarters. Uh, they've been posting a lot about that. We're really excited for them. Um, but Gabrielle, Tell us a little bit about what you do behind the scenes, because in, in many ways, you run Black Belt Magazine social. So tell us what that's like. So what's up, guys? I'm breaking the fourth wall right now. So um, I started working for Black Belt Magazine in July of 2021 after this man decided that he was going to go to med school. So I basically do all of the work that Jackson used to do, which is super cool because I had a pretty good uh, person to uh help me going into the job uh so i do a lot of the behind the scenes stuff i post most of their content for social media so that's their instagram their facebook twitter all that good stuff and i also edit a lot of the articles that go onto their website so i love my job i love everything that i do for black belt i mean come on it's combining social media and martial arts which are like my two favorite things so can it can't get any better than that so I got to ask, because one of the things that whenever I go on the social media and I see Sport Karate posts in particular, because uh, this is Sport Karate September on the Black Belt Magazine page, yeah. right? But one thing that I often am, uh, I laugh about it, is the, the amount of negativity that sometimes we see about Sport Karate, right? So what what is your favorite comment that you see consistently about a Sport Karate? Oh, I could talk about this for days. Um, I I would probably say the baton twirler comments get me because I'm like, oh, well, obviously it's your favorite. Um, but another thing that really gets me is when you see these really intricate round roundhouse kick, side kicks, just you know, high kicks in general that you would see in Taekwondo, which is a traditional martial art. And you get all these people commenting, oh, like, there's no practicality behind a high kick when, I mean, look at Holly Holm and UFC. So I don't know. It's, there are so many, uh, what is it called? Uh, keyboard warriors out there right now that it's just, it's, it's funny to read the comments back. Right. And, and I think for me, it's it's the assumption that by calling it martial arts, that every sport karate competitor is trying to say that everything that we do is going to work in combat. I'll be the first one to tell you, I have never thrown my bow in the air thinking, man, this is going to mess somebody up when I do it to them. Right. So sport karate is about the sport. It's about trying to push yourself to become a better practitioner, whether you test your skills by displaying them in a form 
or whether you test them in a point fighting match by not trying to knock the other person out or incapacitate them, but by trying to see who is faster, who can land a cleaner technique first, who can have the more effective strategy and defense, right? These are all tests of true martial arts skill that you do need to be able to defend yourself to be effective in combat. But nobody's saying that, you know, you're going to do flash kicks and, and blitz techniques when you're actually in that combat situation. So the assumption that many people make that like, oh, well, these people think that this is self-defense when that is not the case whatsoever. We know it's not self-defense. Exactly. Like, that's, yeah. And so it, I wanted to throw that out there just because I feel like as someone who's behind the scenes on the social media and as much of that as we see, and it's it's not that we we don't respect those opinions because those opinions are respected, but I think it, it just requires education because I think if the people making those comments realize that we're not trying to say this is what you should do to defend yourself, then it would change things, right? Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to give a chance to shout out Sport Karate September because we're about to dive into some of the uh, some of the questions that have been submitted. We've gotten a couple here live. We're going to do some of the user submitted or pre user submitted, which is some kind of game, the pre submitted questions. Uh, but I wanted to shout out Sport Karate September as well because if you guys check out the Paul Mitchell. Instagram page, which recently passed 50,000 followers. We're up near 60,000 now. And I'm going to change our camera angle ever so slightly so that you guys can sh see the shirt that I am repping inspired by Team Paul Mitchell Martial Arts. Now, the reason this shirt is important is because for the first time that I can ever remember, Team Paul Mitchell is giving away a T-shirt with the Team Paul Mitchell logo. Like there was a long time where the only way to get a Team Paul Mitchell shirt was to get on the team. Like it, like those were the only people that had shirts. When I first got on the team, parents didn't even get the shirts. Like mom and dad couldn't even have Paul Mitchell shirts. You were either on the team or you were coaching the team, and that's how you got one of these shirts. But these shirts in particular, you see it says inspired by. So these are fan T-shirts. It's meant to be like the, the ultimate fan memorabilia for Team Paul Mitchell at this time. They were made by Century Martial Arts. Let me try to show off. Century Martial Arts produced these specifically for the Team Paul Mitchell experience at the U.S. Open and the Martial Arts Super Show in Las Vegas. And we have just a few left over. They're right over there behind the camera. And we're doing a giveaway right now where if you post a video saying in the video, or you can throw it in the caption, how Team Paul Mitchell inspires you, and then do a martial arts combo, you have a chance to win one of those three shirts, which is like, I don't think people realize how crazy that is. Like Paul Mitchell doesn't just give out shirts. The fact that this is happening is a really big deal. And I want people to jump on that opportunity. Uh, but without further ado, Let's dive into some of the questions. I know that we got one uh, that was thrown in here live already. This is from Jacqueline, and she asked, what is the most valuable lesson you have learned from training in martial arts, but also in teaching it to others? So I'll let you start off. Okay. I would say one of the most important things that I've learned is that results don't happen after one training session, right? It's the little things. It's the little uh, training techniques that you have to do over and over and over again. Like I tell all my students that repetition is key and I'm not just saying that to, you know, fill in time, but it's, it's so important that it's not just a one day of training. It's every single day, every single second that you can get on the mats is valuable. That's a good one. I think when you tie in the fact that, you know, what have you also learned from teaching, right? I think that my biggest one is that that masterful understanding is the key to masterful execution, right? And what I mean by that is, is that if you, you can see a technique and you can replicate a technique and you can pull it off, but you're not going to master the technique by watching and replicating, right? I think that study is extremely important because that was something that I always did as a competitor is I would study film and I would try to truly understand why a technique is done a certain way. When, when so-and-so does this technique, why do they do it this way? Why do they use this timing? Why do they, why do they pause for this long after it in the case of a form choreography standpoint? And as I got more and more into teaching, because I've been teaching private and seminars since I was 14, that was one thing that I learned that, you know, I was only 14, so I had not reached my prime as a competitor when I started teaching. But when I started teaching professionally, it forced me 
to have a more advanced understanding of the techniques, which allowed me to do more with my creativity, with my choreography. And, and so that's where I get that phrase, masterful understanding leads to masterful execution, right? Because if you truly understand all the ins and outs of a technique or a combo, a form, a concept, that is what's going to allow you to execute it as a high level. And I feel like oftentimes there's people out there who do something because they know how, but not because they understand why. And I think that that understanding is key. And that was one thing that was revealed to me through teaching. Jacqueline is going off here. So she's got another one. Uh, let's say she's, oh, it's Jackie, not Jacqueline. She goes by Jackie. Oh, wait, is this a family friend? She goes to CMA. Oh, that's awesome. Well, hey, family <laughs> friends in the chat. Uh, and so she says, have you ever experienced stress and doubt in your ability as an athlete? If so, how did or do you overcome those moments? You're both so accomplished and seem so at ease. Any, uh, any tips for an old lady new to martial arts? Um, so, babe, I'll, I'll let you start. Since First of all, you are not old. What the heck, Jackie? Um, you're killing it, by the way. Um, yeah, I definitely have. When I was younger and I was first coming up into the sport karate scene, I was definitely not as athletic as I say I am now. And a lot of sport karate involves tricking, especially for CMX forms. And I was not the best jumper. So it I runs in the face. <laughs> so, you know, it was just I, I kept comparing myself to the other people in my division who were able to throw these back flips and front flips and I wasn't able to do that even even after trying over and over and over again. It just never really was for me. Um so I started training in different ways. I trained I started training my hands to be faster. I started training my techniques to be cleaner. Um so that was definitely one of the that was an experience where I had a lot of doubt in my ability as a martial artist. Then moving forward, when I started getting into the traditional stuff, which is what I'm more known, which is what I am known for. I'm not known for CMX forms whatsoever. Um, I was, I never really excelled until I made it to the adult division. Um, I was, I started training traditional forms when I was 16, at least seriously. Um, and it was just consistent fourth place, fifth place, sixth place, so on and so on. Um, so it wasn't until I was 18 where I guess the judges finally started taking notice of me. And that's when I started doing better in the division. So like I said before, repetition is key. If I had just given up after getting sixth place, then I wouldn't be here today. So mm -hmm. I think that's the perfect answer. I'll leave it at that. And it's actually a good segue to one of the questions that we got submitted beforehand. So again, if you're just tuning in, we're taking live questions as well. We're giving priority to live questions. Um, but I do want to make sure that we hit on most, if not all, the questions that got submitted beforehand. And one of them is, let me find it, because it's directly related to, to the last part of that question, saying like tips for an old lady, even though you're not, getting into martial arts, right? And so this question is from, uh, and I'm, I'm going to go by username so that the Instagram users that submitted comments are getting a shout out here. So this is uh, Mikey T413 on Instagram. And they want to know, biggest tip for someone who wants to be big in the competition circuit, namely NASCA, um, but I'm 26. So 26 in sport karate years, that is kind of late getting a start. Mm -hmm. But I think you're a perfect example of someone who, you're not 26 yet, but you had your, your blooming, if you will, later on in your martial arts career. You weren't somebody that was like a lot of others, like me. I've been traveling the NASCAR circuit since I was eight years old, right? So, but there are the success stories of people like you who come into the sport a little bit later on. Even people coming into the sport as late as 26. I think there's a lot of opportunities in sport karate right now in the senior division once you get to that 30 plus where seniors are getting the recognition they deserve, they're getting put on stage more, they get a buy into the Warrior Cup finals if they win the senior grands. So I think there are a lot more opportunities out there for seniors, but don't wait till you turn 30. Jump out there right now while you're 26 and go mix it up with some of the 18 to 29 competitors uh, because it truly is never too late to get started. But I'll let you tell your story because like like you were saying, I mean, you, you came to be later on in your career. Yeah. Um so I first started training traditional, well, I, I say traditional forms, but I really mean Japanese karate when I was 16, because um, I was originally a Taekwondo competitor, but, you know, for NASCA, Taekwondo forms don't usually place past, like, third place, so. Which is I, something we're working on. Which is something we're working on. Let's get that traditional Korean challenge in there. Um, so I started taking private lessons from Sensei Robert Young, 
And that's when I started really blossoming in the Japanese division. So it took time. It wasn't just first places overnight. Um, I had to fight for my spot and I wouldn't change a thing. I mean, it's, it's one of the hardest periods of my life, just training in the dojo every single day from uh, after school until 10 p.m. So you, you guys have got it. Good motivation there, babe. Thank I love you. it. I love it. I do want to give a shout out to some of the other people jumping in the comments. Uh, Yo Mama is hey, in Mama. the comments, so give her a shout out. And then I think I saw another couple up here. Yeah, we got Mike Brube. My favorites are when they say that. that oh, he's going back. He's going back to what we were talking about at the beginning. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're not trying to start any fights here. We're trying. We're trying to keep it real. But I know that Mike Brume also did submit a couple of questions beforehand. So let me let me go to one of the questions. He actually texted it to me directly. So I'm gonna I'm gonna shift gears on where I'm getting my questions from here real quick. So oh, this is a tough one. So Mike's question was I'm gonna summarize it. He says like, who are in your opinion the top teams in the sport right now based on stats, the players they have, the personnel, right? And, and I think, Mike, the, the first thing that I'll say here is you're going to get very bi biased answers from both of us yeah. because I am going to say Team Paul Mitchell and Competitive Edge and Gabrielle is going to say Team Mitchell. Obviously. Right? Um, but I, I do think well, one thing that I will say that I've always loved about Paul Mitchell and that Competitive Edge is starting to do more of is that if you truly want to be considered one of the best teams in sport karate, it's important to be able to be successful at all aspects of sport karate, right? Including fighting and forms and weapons, including all aspects of forms and weapons, which includes the soft style, the traditional divisions, not just CMX, right? And obviously teams are gonna go through peaks and valleys where their roster includes more or less of those players. But I think that the teams that make it part of their mission statement to have that holistic environment of, hey, we've got top point fighters, we've got top forms of weapons competitors, and I'll give other teams a shout out too. Obviously, Paul Mitchell in our 35 years of existence has always tried to do that, but teams that are doing it now are like Top 10 Team USA. They field a forms and weapons team as well as a fighting team. Team Revolution, more up and coming, has a forms and weapons team and a fighting team, right? And there's others as well that I'm sure I'm forgetting. But I do think that having both sides of that, and by the way, Team AKA has had some good fighters in their day. It's never been one of like y'all's primary focuses, but y'all have had good fighters. I think uh, Ross Cook at one point was fighting for AKA. Yeah, it? I believe so. Yeah. So I think that that is a big part of if you want to be like one of the best teams to have both. Um, and like I said, with Competitive Edge, the team that I coach alongside Jake and Reed and Cole Presley, um, is we've been trying to do some more of that too, right? There's a reason that Cheeks Elizondo is on Competitive Edge, right? Because not only is he good in the traditional COD division, more than a diamond ring for it, um, but he's also a fantastic fighter. And so when he expressed interest in joining our team, we were like, hey, let's take point fighting a little bit more seriously. We've got other point fighters as well including Cody and Michael Molina, Rebecca Hammond, among others, right? Uh, so I, I do think that, a, that an emphasis on both forms and weapons and point fighting is important to be considered in that breath. Uh, but obviously, there's a lot of fantastic teams um, that do just one or the other, right? Mm -hmm. So, babe, I'll let you kind of give your perspective on, like, kind of top teams and that whole conversation. Yeah, well, obviously, uh, if you look at this right here, <laughs> Gabrielle, team captain, I'm just playing. But obviously, like, the reason why I value Team AKA so much is because it's it's such a family experience. Like I feel like we we base really highly on the family aspect before putting people on the team because if you're a good fit and you're trying hard, then heck yeah, we want you. Because I feel like also with Team AKA, they don't just take the first place competitors, right? We like to take the fourth place competitors, fifth place and so on, and then raise them up to be the champions that they have, that they can be. So that's that's a reason why I've always loved Team AKA. I mean, when I got put on the team, I was, again, just not anywhere near to where I am now. Again, consistent fifth place competitor. And I feel like with all of the confidence that they have put in me, I, I don't think I'd be anywhere close to where I am now without them. So that's well my that's my little biased opinion. What are you about to say? I just said, well said, babe. Oh, thank you. I was giving you a compliment. Thank you very that's, much. That's a husband's job. Anyway, so we've got some other live questions coming in here. So let's see what we've got. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Oh, this is a good one. So uh, Leando Duarte wants to know, Amanda wants to know, 
if it was hard for you to go from Taekwondo to karate, making that transition? Mm -hmm. Hi, Amanda. Well, it was definitely different. I mean, I was going into karate thinking it was going to be similar. It's just another black belt. You know, it, I was so wrong. Not only are all of the stances completely different, but I had to kind of rewire my brain on how to learn because growing up, my parents were my Taekwondo teachers. teachers. So going from that and being taught from my parents to going to being taught from an Olympic, basically an Olympic coach, um, I had to learn how to take direction differently and also basically learn a completely new style at the same time. So it was it was pretty hard at first, but after I learned all the basics, then it's just like learning any other style. So. And that's one thing that I'm a big fan of is any time that somebody branches out and tries to learn a new style, right? Like that was one thing that I always tried to do when I was a young martial artist was not only learning, uh, you know, just the Taekwondo that I was coming up in, but also doing some Kali, doing some Jiu Jitsu, some Judo, some Hapkido, like being well versed in a bunch of different styles, I think is really important in general, right? And so we've got another question coming in. This is from uh, Angelique, or as the sport karate community may know, Colin and Carrie Raby's mom, shout out Colin and Carrie. I work with both of them. Uh, and she asks, uh, how could you deal with school and karate at the same time? This is the million dollar question, right? Yeah. I mean, you're definitely going to say goodbye to your social life. At least I could. <laughs> um, yeah, hold on, hold on. We, we were social enough to find each other. We, we were social enough to find each other. But I remember many weekends having to say goodbye or just dropping out from social events so I could focus on getting my homework done. So during the week at, after school, I was able to get in the karate training. So, I mean, I think a big part of it is just uh, scheduling things out. You know, just taking the first few days out of the week and writing down specific times for when you're going to do what and when. So schedule things out and just know that sacrifices will probably have to be made. That's a good one. I couldn't have said it better myself. And, and I think that, you know, one one helps the other. I saw somebody make a comment like that. Yeah, your, your mom, I don't know what this was in reference to one helping the other, but it's in reference to academics and martial arts as well, because that's one thing that's great. And this is why I tell anybody with kids to get them in martial arts is because like martial arts is really what instilled in me like the desire to excel in academics because martial arts taught me from day one, like you've got to respect others. And it also taught me goal setting, right? Like the moment you put on a white belt, you want to be a yellow belt. Mm -hmm. The moment you put on a yellow belt, you want to be an orange belt. The right. whole time you want to be a black belt. And so goal setting is an inherent part of martial arts that isn't always there in other sports. Like I feel like you can have fun in martial arts, but there's also the goal setting. Whereas like when I played baseball, I never cared about winning a baseball game. Like all I cared about when I played baseball was like hanging out with buddies and sitting in the outfield and picking grass and getting a free Coke at the end of the game. <laughs> like the free Coke at the end of the game is the only thing that matters. Like I never cared about winning a baseball game. And so I think that inherently in martial arts with that built in goal setting, like that taught me like, oh, well, if I'm at school, then I, I want to do well. Like I want to go get that. Right. And, and like when I got to high school and I realized how other people saw the world and I realized that there were other people who were like, yeah, you know, as long as I get to see you and I'm cool. Like I, I never, I had never had those thoughts. And the reason I never had a thought like that is because of my upbringing in the martial arts. Right. So I think they help each other out a lot. And when it comes to like, if you want to travel and be a competitor and balance that with school, um, it goes back to what Gabrielle said of putting in the time and being willing to make the sacrifices. Right. There were times where if I had a test on Monday and I was traveling to a tournament on Saturday, um, that meant that if I had a friend's birthday party on Sunday, I wasn't going to it, right? I would go to the karate tournament on Saturday. I would study for the test on Sunday, and I would take the test on Monday. And, and it's those type of hard choices that you got to make um, because th there is a level of sacrifice. Anytime that you want to excel at two different things, martial arts and academics, martial arts and something else, professional life and a hobby. Anytime you want to excel at two things, there's sacrifices that have to be made in order for you to achieve that. Um, and I think that's no different. But I will reiterate, the sacrifice should never be to the academics, right? The one thing that I always preach is, is that it's academics first, martial arts second. And as soon as the academics start to slip, you pull back on the martial arts a little bit, get the academics in order, and then you can pursue more of the martial arts. Right. So I'm going to read through the comments real quick here. Jeannie Jones, shout out. Thank you for tuning in. Like always, big fan of the show. And then uh, so Jackie's got one more. So we'll do a little fun one before we dive into some of the pre-submitted questions. 
She wants to know uh, what her favorite Disney movies are. Jackie, I love this question, but it's a hard question for me because anyone that knows me and Jackson knows how much we love Disney. I mean, he literally proposed to me in Disney World, so it's it's very close to our heart. Pretty good, right? Pretty good, right? I yeah, you did pretty good. Uh, oh, this is such a hard question. I would say it's a little bit of a tie. I mean, you have to put Lion King on that list. Lion King is such an amazing movie. Our first date back in 2015 was seeing Lion King on Broadway. So, I mean, come on. Pretty and good then, first date. Pretty good, for, pretty good first date. And then also, I love Pixar's Coco. If you've seen it, oh, you're you know putting why. Coco up there. Coco makes me bowl my eyes out. I mean, it's a good it. movie, but in the same breath as Lion King. Yes, the music. I don't know. The visual. I don't know about that. It's, it's a good movie, but it's not Lion King. Well, I know his favorite. I mean, yeah, Lion King is one of the greatest cinematic masterpieces ever created. It's the perfect movie. There's literally nothing wrong with the Lion King. There's there's not a single part of the Lion King that's not good. Right. But I will also give an honorable mention to one of my personal favorite characters. The movie's a good movie, not a great movie, but it's a very good movie. Can I guess? Sure. Big Hero 6. Yeah. yeah. Big Hero 6 is a very good movie. It's not a great movie. It doesn't deserve to be in the same breath as Lion King. But there is a doctor robot who learns karate in the middle of the movie. <laughs> like, you don't get better than that. And he's like adorable. The band That's but true. Anyway. Another honorable book. Mm. Another honorable mention. Let's keep Lilo. in mind is some martial arts. Okay, movies. okay, okay. Lilo and Stitch also. Oh, yeah, of course. That's a good feel-good movie. Yeah. Like, if you just, like, if, if you're down and you just need to smile, watch Lilo and Stitch. Yeah. I think that's a good one. Okay. Anyway, enough Disney talk. <laughs> now let's get back <laughs> to the martial arts stuff. We're going to jump into a user-submitted question here. You, I, I use that phrase. submitted Pre-submitted. I don't know where I get that from. Anyway, let's just go to, like, the first one I see. Okay. So this, uh, let's start with this one. This is a good one. Hmm. Carly.Jenkins on uh, Instagram. What is your favorite U.S. Open memory? I have two. Okay, so when- Wait, you're going to tie the Disney movies. Now you got to pick two. Yes, okay. I have two. I can't pick one over the other. Okay, my first one is after me and Jackson started dating in 2016, he did not win the Bad of Atlanta or U.S. Open. And this is right after we started dating. So I thought I was bad luck. I thought it was bad luck. I thought I was bad juju in the relationship. And then US Open 2017, he won. And to see him on stage do his thing is amazing. Then thanks, my, thanks for bringing up those L's. <laughs> I thought it was bad luck. Then my second favorite, obviously, is just this past US Open. I took away my first ISKA title. So that was a big one. Yeah, that's one of my favorites. It's like watching you win and me not having to worry about doing anything. That was dope. Um, I'd say my favorite U.S. Open memory. The 2017 win was big for me uh, because I wanted the 2016 one. So coming back and winning 2017, that was that was obviously a big deal. Um, but, you know, I think that, that my favorite U.S. Open memory would have to be uh, 2021 just because of the, the circumstance that yeah. was, right? Like coming out of the pandemic, um, I had contemplated just being done. I had contemplated just, you know, because I, I won my last tournament before the pandemic was Irish Open. Mm -hmm. And the last form that I ran at Irish Open, I got perfect. I got 10 yes. from every judge. And throughout the pandemic, it was like, man, I won a Warrior Cup. And then I went to the Irish Open and got 10s. It was technically an undefeated season, even though it was only three tournaments. Yeah. Uh, but I was like, maybe, maybe the timing is just right. Maybe, maybe I'll just ride off into the sunset, right? And during the pandemic, I had also discovered a passion for commentating. Shout out to Jesse Ray and the Virtual Fight Tour for kind of giving me some of my first early opportunities to do that, where then people recognized my talent. I got the opportunity to go do a pro, go do pro point. Um, and really, I, I fell in love with commentating. And I always, even when I was a kid, I thought about, man, like after I'm done competing, it'd be really cool to commentate the U.S. Open because that's the tournament that's always been commentated, right? And so I was like, you know, going into literally the week of 2021 U.S. Open, I had basically made the decision that I would compete yeah. in the daytime because I'd gotten the itch again, but that I wouldn't compete at night and that I would just commentate in the night show, right? Like I would scratch my itch by competing in the daytime and then I'll go commentate and I'll be happy with that. And then there were some conversations that happened at the U.S. Open, and 
essentially, and, and someday on the podcast, I'll reveal the entire story because it's a wild, it story a wild story of what transpired within 24 hours of the U.S. Open starting. Uh, but tonight's not the night for that story. Uh, but basically, there was a conversation where the promoters decided, well, what if you could be in the booth and on stage? Like, what if you could do half the show in the booth and then go compete and then come back to the booth for an interview after you compete? And then there was a lot of questions with that, obviously. We're like, well, this is going to look really stupid if Jackson goes up there and loses, right? <laughs> so I, I, there was extra pressure on me because, like, I needed to go win, right? Mm-hmm. So that, that was big. Um, but then, like – just in retrospect, the fact that I did that, like the fact that I showed up to the night show in a suit, did not warm up, commentated, and then three divisions before my division changed out of my suit, put a uniform on, did sync with Jake, mm-hmm. one sync with Jake, had like three divisions or so in between, and then went out there and did the individual division and finished the show with a win. I still don't fully believe it. I don't that. know how you do it. I don't really – I, I don't remember a lot of doing it because it's just like, you're just going oh, and it just God. happens. Yeah. But like the fact that I did that and then, you know, with that kind of being, you know, who knows if I'll compete again. I reserve the right I to know. come back. I reserve the right to come back whenever I want to. Uh, you don't know me. I haven't told you if I'm going to compete. Okay, but um, you will compete. Yeah, yeah, we'll see. Uh, but no, I mean, that that's my favorite U.S. Open story just because it's like, I mean, how cool is that? Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and I have so much appreciation to the U.S. Open and their entire promoting team for, like, making that possible in the first place because it's, you know, it's not just anybody that can be like, hey, can I uh, commentate and compete? So, like, the fact that they gave me that opportunity, um, that's something I'll never forget and I'll, I'll always be appreciative of. Good question. That was a good question. Good question. We've good. talked a lot about us. Let's talk about other people. Okay. Carly also wants to know, who was your biggest inspiration growing up in sport karate? You got people on, no more ties. Who, who was your biggest inspiration growing up? In so they have to be a sport karate competitor? Yes. Yeah? Yes. Okay. <laughs> because okay. it's in okay. sport karate. Okay, okay, okay. Because okay. I have, I know my, who my inspiration in martial arts is my parents. Um, I would probably say Jessica Mellon because she is from Karate World Lineage. She was my father's student, but she was also... Um, one of the top competitors in NASCA. So um, having her at the karate school growing up, watching her uh, train in the corner before a tournament was very inspirational to me. That's a good one. This is tough. I got to pick one. See, I did this to you, and now it makes yeah, it hard uh-huh. on me. I got to pick one How the tables have turned. There were so many early in my career, right? Like there were so many people that I looked up to early on. Bo competitors, Nate Andre, Lauren Carney, Corey Lutkis, um, and then just weapons competitors in general and their greatness, Matt Emig, Kalman Choka. I mean, there, there were so many. I think that if, if I look at across the course of my career, the, the one person who inspired me more than any of them, it would be Kevin Thompson. Because, you know, Kevin not only was the pinnacle of excellence in sport karate, could win forms, weapons, fighting, is, is considered by almost everyone to be the greatest of all time in sport yeah. karate because he could do literally everything, everything. and be the best at it. Um, you know, and, and seeing his battle with, with ALS and, you know, my interest in going to medical school and, and you know, wanting to, to hopefully be involved in, in treating patients like that one day, uh, you know, Kevin's whole journey and what he stood for and what he represented was, was my biggest inspiration. Um, and it's interesting because I didn't really get to know Kevin until after I had already climbed the mountain. Like I was already on Paul Mitchell when, when I got to know Kevin. Um, but he had such a significant impact on the second half of my career um, that, I mean, he, he's the guy, like he's the guy that I looked up to more than any other. Uh, so yeah, that's, Always a good question. That, if I didn't say it, that was also Carly Jenkins. So shout out Carly for giving us a lot of good questions good from the questions, Instagram. Carly. Um, there's a couple that we're going to go through pretty quickly here. Uh, so Missy98 underscore from Instagram wants to be giving the shout out. Um, I think this is a direct question for me because it says chances of more Canadians being added to the Paul Mitchell roster in the future. Um, and I think the answer is, yeah, I mean, I think Paul Mitchell has a pretty good track record uh, of always recruiting internationally, right? I mean, we've had many Canadian competitors on the team before. We've got a Canadian on the team right now, and Esteban Tremblay, hashtag Air Canada. Um, and then, well, oh, the Hungarians, right? Like, yeah. we, we picked up, like, what, 
four or five Hungarians over the last several years. Um, so Paul Mitchell, definitely, that we look at international talent. Um, obviously, I'm not going to say anything about the scouting situations and all that, but international talent is always considered. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. But that, that was a good quick one to get through. Um, I, I, you've already touched on this a little bit, but but Lawson.Kofer asks a good question once again from Instagram. And I want you to answer this more directly because I think it's it's a cool part of your story. Did you ever think you would make it to the top? I like the way he worded that. No, no, I did not. I remember first coming into the sport, and obviously Jax remembers because when we first started dating, I was 15 years old. My confidence has changed so much competing in sport karate. At first, I was very complacent with my fourth places because I thought that's the best I could do. I was just happy to show up to the karate tournaments, give it my all, and then that was that, hang out with my friends after competing. But, and honestly, a big part of that comes from you because you had always been so confident and I feel like that's something that you kind of instilled in our relationship and you you definitely showed me that there was so much more that I could do. So, thank you, honey. That was very sweet. Thank you. Uh, I got a little distracted in the middle of that because I think we're getting some texts live. Ooh. Let me see. Oh, wait, no, that's just a private text. It's typically, what's funny is it was somebody who like always tunes into the show and they sent me a text and I thought that it was going to be a question to ask on the show, um, but then it, it, was, it was not that. So I'm not, I'm not going to reveal the, the content of that text message, which is kind of funny. And what's really funny is when that person inevitably watches this episode back, because I know they will, um, they're going to talk about that. Oh, wait. Is that a question? Oh, wait, no, it is. Wait. The, oh, wait, hold on. Oh, this is for the show. Oh. What's up, Philip? It's just, <laughs> I think, okay, so let's not reveal any names if I'm not going to answer the question. <laughs> you just made this super awkward. Well, I don't know what you're going to say. You just, I was going to say that we're not going to address this directly because, oh. <laughs> Philip, thank you. Thank you, my guy. We will talk about this another time and then maybe potentially talk about it on the show at some point. But <laughs> I'm sorry. I just got excited. <laughs> okay. Yes, you got very excited. And now we're gonna move on. <laughs> All right, we're we're losing viewers because this is this is becoming a trend. No, I'm just kidding. So here's what we're gonna do. We have some questions. We might go back to the questions, but another thing that I wanted to do in this show, and we've been teasing it a little bit, is I, I've started doing this thing where we try to play like a game every time there's an episode. Mm -hmm. Because I think it provides some really good interaction with the audience, and it's also a lot of fun for any guest on the show to do. And so I want to play an old trusty game that we have on the show. We are going to play a round of Sport Karate Team Roulette with Gabrielle. I know it's a fan favorite. And then another thing we're going to do is we're also going to play one round of Sport Karate 20 Questions. And really the inspiration for doing this is I've said on the show before that I would love to do a game night show at some point. Um, and in order to do that, we have to establish the types of games that people enjoy watching us play. So I want to get you guys this feedback. We're going to do an abbreviated version of Sport Karate Team Roulette. And as we play the game, we're going to go for four spots. We just need a traditional forms, a traditional weapons, a CMX forms, a uh, CMX weapons. All right. Okay? So we're going to fill those four spots. And um, we're going to see who's got the better team. And we rely on you guys chiming in in the comments to let us know who it is that's that, going to be yeah. the winner, right? Who's got the better team. So, babe, since you are the guest, I will let you pick first. Okay. And that means that you get to draw your own team from the hat. I got to write out these teams, too. Yes, the handwriting on these on these <laughs> cards is Gabrielle's handwriting. All right, I got... You got a team that only has fighters, so we're going <laughs> to put that down and let you try again. <laughs> I got KTOC Impex. Okay. Ooh, so you get a competitor from team KTOC slash Impex, and this is all time, by the way. So it doesn't have to be somebody uh, active right now. It can be anybody from hi the history of those two teams. Too much about the history. I'm just gonna go. Did you really just admit on my show that you don't know enough about the history? <laughs> I'm just gonna do the safe bet, consistent Joey Castro traditional forms. Us, us. Okay, so Gabrielle's got Joey Castro traditional forms. That's pretty solid, not gonna lie. 
pretty solid. All right, my pick is. Oh, I got Team United, which basically, so Team United is the team that's coached by Trevor and Casey Nash. And uh, obviously, Trevor Nash is a fighter, but that means that I can take Casey. And I'm going to take Casey Nash for traditional weapons, uh, which means that you're not beating me in traditional Dang. <laughs> so you got Joey Castro, traditional forms. I got Casey Nash, traditional weapons. Gabrielle's pick again. All right. Anyone from that team. <laughs> <laughs> so Gabrielle just gets to keep going until she gets the team I didn't she know likes. That's that team. That's a team. That is a team of only fighters. <laughs> I'm getting really unlucky here, you guys. Well, I should have taken the fighting teams out of the hat, <laughs> knowing that Gabrielle was going to be on the show. I that's know. what I should have done. Okay. I keep going. <laughs> this is her last try. She's got to pick somebody from this team. Okay. Do you know the advantage that you have right now? You you have such a massive advantage. Isn't this a fighting team? There's forms and weapons competitors on Team Dojo Elite. Oh, 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 oh. Okay. I'm going to go Connor Chastain, CMX Weapons. Solid choice. Very solid. Okay. So I need, I need a CMX weapons that can take down Connor Chastain, and I need a traditional forms that can take down Joey Castro. Let's see. I got, what do we got? What do we got? Top 10 Team USA. We get all time. What's funny is I drew Top 10 Team USA when I played this game with Rashad, and I think I'm going to make the same pick. Ooh. Ooh. So when I okay, so I picked I picked Cole Presley last time when I played with Rashad. Oh, that's good. And although I would like Cole Presley in that matchup for CMX weapons, I forgot about somebody last time when I picked Top Team USA that I shouldn't have forgotten about. And I'm going to take Mason Stowell. Oh. So now we got we got the the battle that's out there right now yeah. with Mason Stowell yeah. and Joey Castro. That's a good one. So I'm taking Mason Stowell. That is a really good one. And now I'm going to let you go again. So I got Mason Stowell and Casey Marks. I need all CMX. You got Joey Castro, Connor Chastain. Jackson. You got a fighting team. It's okay. It's okay. We're just we're letting Gabrielle. I'm so sorry, guys. Gabrielle can do whatever she wants. She's gonna lose to me anyway, so it's okay. Team Emmy. Ooh, Ooh. Uh, you know this one. Oh, that's a pretty good team. Okay, so what do I have so far? I've got Joey for traditional forms, and then I've got Connor for CMX weapons. Yep. Uh, so I have CMX forms and weapons. So you're going to take CMX Forms here. So I'm going to take CMX Forms here. <laughs> I will take... Mackenzie, Danny, I know, I'm Aiden, thinking. Tyler. I know. Oh, I can't take Matt. Oh, well, I guess when I drew Team Emig, I did take Matt. So low-key, you okay, can take Okay, I'm going to take Matt Emig, mm. CMX Forms. Mm. Well, that sucks be better than that. Yeah. That sucks for me. <laughs> so I need a CMX Forms to go against Matt. I need a CMX Weapons to go against Connor. Come on. Give me something good. Give me Pumage. Give me Pumage. If I can pick one up. Let's see here. Florida Sport Martial Arts Academy. And I'm going to take Mark Canizato to go up against Connor Chastain and CMX Weapons. That's what I'm taking. Oh, Mark Canizato. That is such a good one. So yeah. I've got I've got Mark Canizato, Mason Stowell, and Casey Nash, which means that I'm definitely going to win. But no, I'm just kidding. Uh, so now you can pick your next. All one. right. So is this, this is your for, last one? Yeah, this is for traditional weapons. Oh, so you've got to find. A I've got to find a traditional weapons competitor. Okay. All right. Give me something good, please. Straight, straight up. up. You need a traditional weapons competitor on Team Straight Up. Y'all might have to help her out in the comments. <laughs> please help me out in the comments. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm thinking. Cool. Okay, so let's let me think of competitors that were on straight up. There's so many options. I know, but I'm having a the most of dominant life. junior traditional competitor of all time. What? Ryan Wells. I competed <laughs> against Ryan Wells. <laughs> Did he do traditional weapons? Yes. I'm gonna choose a Ryan Wells. I have more names to list. I'm pretty sure Calvin was on straight up at one point when he was younger. Was he really? I think so. I know he was on Metro. I think he might have been on straight up for a hot minute when he was younger. Am I dreaming that? I might be dreaming that. Anyway. 
I think but I there's know. definitely others. But yeah, Ryan Wells, you can't go wrong with that. Too. All right, so now I need one. The last one I need is CMX Forms. I need somebody from this team to do CMX Forms. It is, I pulled a Gabrielle. I pulled a fighting team. My bad. My bad. My bad. <laughs> Going again. Team Revolution to do CMX forms. Team Revolution doing CMX forms. I'm trying to make sure I don't forget anybody. There's a lot of names coming to mind, but I want to make sure I don't mess up and forget somebody that I don't want to forget. I think I'm going to give the seniors some love here. Yeah, I was thinking about I think that's the seniors. move. I think the move is giving the seniors some love, and I'm going to go with Kevin Kowalczyk. That's what I was thinking. That's my CMX forms competitor. He's got to go up against Matt Emig, so I'm sorry, Kevin. Uh, <laughs> but... There it is. So that, that's my roster. I've got Kevin Kowalczyk. I've got uh, Mason Stowell. I've got Casey Marks. And I have Mark Cannonizato. And that is going up against Gabrielle's. Who is Matt Emig. Then I've got Ryan Wells. I have uh, Joey Castro. And then I have uh, Connor Chastain. Connor Chastain. This is closer than I thought. Mm -hmm. I, th I thought that I had this in the bag and it just got a little bit closer. <laughs> mm. All right, so y'all let us know in the comments who got that win. And while y'all are letting us know in the comments who got that win, we are going to go back to a couple of questions before we then play uh, the 20 questions game that we're going to kind of experiment and see how much you guys like it. I'm going to check out a couple of the comments coming in here. So we've got Christopher Daniels. I love your commentary. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Started martial arts when I was 13. Was a Maryland State champion. That's wow. awesome. We're now living yeah, in we're, Maryland. Yeah, we're Marylanders. I uh, want to go back for another black belt, even though I now suffer from visual impairment. So uh, we give him inspiration. So that's awesome. Chris, you go out there. You go get another black belt. Uh, we support this. you. Uh, you rock it on your journey. And then Philip Brumay, which, by the way, we made it super awkward because it was all in the moment. But really, his, his question had a lot of layers. And I like to be able to think through these things. It's not like it was anything scandalous or bad. It's just it's a question I want to think through more. Maybe we'll do it on the show next week. But we are going to give the Brumay family some love because Mama Brumay, Angela Brumay, she Brume. says, what is your favorite newlywed moment? Oh. I've got to answer this question carefully. <laughs> I let me think. There are so many, and I every single time someone asks me this question, I say my favorite day has been every single day since moving in with him because we've been long distance our entire relationship since I was 15 years old. So honestly, I would say the moving in process and just being able to be with him every morning and eat breakfast together is just so special because we've never had that before. That's a good one. That's a general one. I'm going to go specific. Okay. So my favorite moment is when we were building our nightstands for the bedroom. Aww. Because, <laughs> like, we've never lived together before. And when I was here alone, it was just a dude's apartment. So there was, like, nothing in here, right? And uh, so, <laughs> so when we ordered nightstands to, like, actually have something next to the bed because – Gabrielle wasn't okay with just laying her phone on the floor for it to charge. I wonder why. <laughs> um, she, we ordered nightstands. And yeah. then, like, when we got them in, we, like, sat in the floor of our living room and built them together. And that that felt like a very newlywed thing. And I think that's just a lasting memory that will, like, That's so with. sweet. Oh, my goodness. I know. I'm good at this. <laughs> if, you can't, if you can't tell, that's how I wound up. No, I'm just kidding. All right. So now let's go to, I think we've got a couple of other questions that were submitted online. Let's see what we've got here. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. Oh, this one I wanted to make sure that we got to. So I'm glad I pulled this back up. And you know what? To avoid the awkwardness of the Philip question, I'm going to let you answer this. And then I'm going to read Philip's question in detail. And then, Philip, I'm going to have an answer for you. Okay. Philip, I'm so sorry. Well, I was realizing as we were thinking about it. Now, like, oh, look, now Philip's got another one. He said, oh Philip, Philip's God. the star of this podcast now. For Jackson Gabriel, if either of you could do any high-level tricking move, what would it be? Oh, this is a quick one. I would shuriken cutter because shuriken cutters are sitting nasty. Ooh. It's this, an easy answer. I that, is a, that is a really good answer. Oh, gosh. I mean, I got my back. I got my back tuck, but I would love Your to. What? You got me. I was copying you because you were going. I was mimicking a shuriken cut. And I was doing the same thing. I but I um, I consistently got my back flip on a uh, spring floor, but I would have loved to have gotten my flash kick. That's something that I was too scared to try. So your answer is a flash kick? Yes, because it is 
He said any high level. I'm gonna. He said a high level tricking move. And you would do a flash kick. Right, I would do a double cork. Okay, thank you. That's bad. that's bad. A flash that was, kick. That was my true answer. The, the bane of extreme forms existence. A flash kick. Well, that's my answer. That's my second thing. I would respect that. Double but anyway, so the question that I want you to answer while I read Philip's question, while I give Philip the respect he deserves. <laughs> the question is, uh, this is from Regina Thompson. So we got a legend, female point fighting legend. Drop it in the comments here. And she wants to know, will sport karate continue to support and elevate girls and women's competitors across the board? Are we truly valued and treated equal? God, I hope so. So something that just happened at the Capital Classics that I thought was wonderful is they gave a lot more girls recognition on stage. So they put a lot more girls on stage and they also gave uh, the girls bonuses through Female Fighters Matter too. So they're doing amazing things for the sport. They're giving females the recognition that they deserve. Um, but something that I think that needs to happen in the sport is there needs to be a little bit more of separation on stage. So for me, as a traditional forms competitor, I have to compete against CMX forms competitors, which they don't do that in the men's division. I think they should do it um, just because it's like tomatoes and what is it? Apples and apples, apples and, and oranges. oranges. <laughs> tomatoes. Like tomatoes and apples. <laughs> it is like tomatoes and apples. They're two completely different things, and it's very hard. To, <laughs> it's very hard to judge that together. So, anyways, you guys are getting all of us tonight. I wish that I would have had the the composure to to give a more thoughtful answer about that. But when you said tomatoes <laughs> and apples, I, I lost. It apples and oranges. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, it's been a long day. But yes, thank you for addressing that, and and thank you, Regina Thompson, for for submitting that question. And you know, I think that with initiatives like Female Fighters Matter too, and people like Maggie Messina being positive influencers in the sport, uh, and I'm also going to give a shout out to a lot of the men's competitors, both in forms and weapons and in fighting, that have come out and publicly said similar things in support of female competitors and trying to help them get the recognition they deserve. Um, I think that that is incredibly important, um, and I do think that that we're going to see those initiatives continue to have an impact on sport. Karate, uh, which I think is essential. Um, now, I have read Philip's question. I have digested it, and we're not going to leave this podcast awkwardly. We're going to answer it like adults because Jackson knows how to read. Um, so, Philip's question was essentially because I do have to summarize it because there's a lot of layers to it, right? But the question was essentially if somebody is, and this is a CMX based question, right? But if somebody comes out and does some crazy move, right? And that crazy move is like it's the be all end all and you're the person that's got to compete against that crazy move right then strategically what do you do right and i have two answers to this and the funny thing is philip knows me so philip was like and you can't just say you would do something just as hard but different and i'm like well that's the first thing i would do um but i, I will i will see your stipulation philip and i will go beyond that because i think anytime because I, I've been the guy on both sides of that, right? I've been the guy who's created the move that seems like the be all end all that nobody seems to be able to beat. And I've also been the guy that has, you know, somebody done something crazy and then I take an L and then I've got to respond to it. You know what I'm saying? And so as somebody who's been on both sides of that, I think the, the best form of treatment is prevention, right? Uh, it's my medical school brain coming out. So I think the first thing that you do is, is you always want to try to be one step ahead of that curve and you be the person with the be all end all move before somebody else is. Obviously, that's if we lived in a perfect world and you could always be ahead of the curve and that doesn't always happen, right? So if you're not ahead of the curve and somebody else does something, you've got to respond, then what do you do, right? My first answer would be what Philip said that I can't say, which is do something comparable difficulty, um, but just different, right? But then I would add to that, I think that you have to strategically choreograph your routine to highlight other things away from what one move can do, right? So I think that you strategically have to look at it and say, okay, well, yeah, that's crazy and it's awesome that such and such can do this, that, the other, but I'm gonna focus my form on, you know, I'm gonna do comma cut combinations that nobody's ever seen put together before. 
I'm going to do some combination of tricks together that's going to take the attention and put it on combos instead of putting the attention on an individual move or whatever the case may be, right? So I think that strategically, there's things that you can do to highlight certain aspects of your form that say, hey, judges, let's make it about this. And I think that that's really what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is, is that a big part of being a consistently successful sport karate competitor is being able to understand judge psychology and being able to change what the judges base the division on, right? And if you can choreograph your form in a way that says, hey, judges, we're going to base this division on whose karate is better. Or, hey, judges, we're going to base this division on whose tricking is better, right? Whatever the case may be, whatever that category is that you decide you want to dominate, give the judges a performance that shifts their mind to think, well, we don't have a choice to consider this because look at what this guy just did. Right. And so I think that it's not just about fighting fire with fire and always going for the bigger move, but strategically trying to find what is the right thing to do that gets the judges to think in line with your form. What is it that makes the division about what you do instead of allowing the division to be about what other people Right. Um, and even though it was a specific person asking the question and I've addressed that answer to Philip, I think that that is something that can be applied everywhere. Right. I think that anybody can take that. And, and Jeannie Jones brings up a great point. She says, but that doesn't often happen with the judges. Right. And I think that that is where you have to be consistent with it. And this yeah. is something Matt Emig talked about when he was on the show. Right. And it was that sometimes you have to go out there on a limb and do something new even if the judges don't like it and you might have to live with judges not liking it for several tournaments before it catches on. Because ultimately, if you know that it's a good idea and you know that it's part of your strategy to get the judges to think a certain way, then the only way to convince them that you might not convince them of that with one form, but if you do it over the course of three to six months and you're getting, especially now in the age of social media where this has been a hot topic recently. Every judge is on social media. All of a sudden, the trends that judges see on social media may have a subconscious impact on the way that they view divisions next time they show up to a tournament. Oh, wow. Right? Yeah. And so I think, I know I just, I just went big brain <laughs> on that one, right? But I, I do think that that is, that is part of it, right? Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, a, I'm a huge believer in tournaments are not won at the tournament alone. Obviously, you've got to have good decision making. Obviously, you've got to hit your form. Obviously, what happens at the tournament matters more than anything. But there is a component. I would say, I would say as much as 20% of winning, as much as 20% of winning comes down to what you do leading up to the tournament. And I don't mean training to be better, because that's a hundred percent of it, right? Like I, I'm not I'm not talking about training to be better, right? But I'm talking about the way that you are present on social media. Judges are comfortable with competitors they recognize, competitors they know, mm -hmm. competitors that if they saw you do something crazy on Instagram a week ago by chance, they expect to see that in your form. They're like, oh, I remember, I remember seeing this guy's video. I can't wait to see him do that, right? right. And when you don't provide that, then that judge is let down, right? But if you deliver above that, all of a sudden, that judge now has an inflated view of your form because of something that they saw way before the tournament ever started. And then also, in the ring that day before the division starts, right? Like, the way that you carry yourself around the ring. Do you kind of keep your head down around the ring and just, you know, go through your warm-ups and whatever, and you're not big and you're not present? Well, then the judges won't see you as someone who is big and someone who's present. They won't see you as one of the stars. If you want to be the best in the division, walk around like the best in the division. Walk with your chin up. Throw your big tricks and warm-ups. Make people watch you warm up. That was always a big thing that I did when I competed, right? When I was warming up, I wanted to do things in warm-ups that made everybody within eye shot come to that ring. Because if they saw me from afar doing something crazy and they came over to watch me, then they were going to cheer for me. And all of a sudden, the crowd around the ring is in my favor because my warm-ups attracted those people to the ring, right? And I think that just those little things, right? At the same time, if your warm-ups are good enough to attract other people to the ring, think about the psychological effect, effect 
that that I, I mixed impact and effect into one word. Effect, whatever. Anyway. <laughs> so the impact of the warm-ups that you're doing on the psychology of your competitors, right? Great competitors aren't going to be shaken by it, right? But there are competitors where if you're throwing crazy stuff in warm-ups, they're going to be like, are they going to do that? that? Yeah. Are they, is that going to happen right now? Like, I'm not, I'm not ready for this. Like, uh, so I think that all of those elements, right? The way that you promote yourself on social media, because inevitably judges will see that. The way that you carry yourself around the ring, the way that you warm up, the way that you portray your character as an athlete, I think goes a long way, right? Here's the best example, because I don't think that any competitor should ever be arrogant, right? I think every competitor should be confident. I think no competitor should be arrogant. I think that's very, very important because it, there's a very clear difference between arrogant competitors and confident competitors, right? Yeah. Raymond Daniels was someone that always tiptoed on that. There was some, I know Ray, so I know that Ray is, Ray gets a bad rap from some people because of the way that he would celebrate around the ring and all that. But I know Ray and I know that that isn't how Ray meant it. You know what I mean? I know that Ray isn't, Ray is someone that I know to be confident, not arrogant, right? Mm -hmm. And the thing with Ray is, is that when you watched Ray warm up and do the things that he would do in warm ups and the way that he would carry himself around the ring, judges that may or may not be more or less experienced, when they see Raymond Daniels in a ring and they see Ray dive in for a blitz, their hand is starting to go up before the blitz has made contact because they recognize that's the guy. You know what I'm saying? And I think the same thing is true in forms of weapons. So that, that was a deep can of worms that got opened. And that's why I wanted to, to dive into the question. And I know, Philip, I did ad lib on the question a little bit. But I think there's so many different layers to it. Um, and then obviously there is the strategy of like, well, specifically, what are you going to do, which is a whole separate conversation, right? But I think that in general terms, those are some of the things that I would think through, right? And without further ado... And Jeannie Jones dropped in another comment. She said, so true. I remember your warm-ups at Battle of Atlanta before we really knew you. I thought you were showing off just for Benjamin. Aww, which is really that's fun. so sweet. Uh, I was. I was totally showing off just for Ben. Ben, all those tricks were for you. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, I'm not kidding, Ben. That was, that was for real. Anyway, okay, so Philip, Philip texted me. Let me see if he... He loved that answer. Yeah. I, I successfully navigated the question that we thought was going to make the podcast awkward. No. Anyway. Uh, so now last thing that we're going to do on this show, like I said, we're going to play a game and we're going to see if you guys enjoy watching us play the game. And this is just good old fashioned 20 questions, right? So I'm going to start because I want to see if you can figure out who I'm going to think of. And then you're going to do it to me. You can get me back. Okay. This is funny. This is funny because Gabrielle hates this game. In real life, when we're on a car ride, Gabrielle will not play 20 questions with me. So I'm taking advantage of her on the podcast. Do you have something to say? No. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> um, so I'm forcing Gabrielle to play 20 questions. But we're playing sport karate 20 questions. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. I want you guys in the comments to see if you can figure out who it is. So this is going to be a sport karate competitor. I won't make it too terribly difficult on you. In fact... I will make it a sport karate competitor who is active today. Okay. A sport karate competitor who is competing right now, that's who I will make it. That makes it much easier for me. Okay. okay. Thank you. And uh, I want you guys to try to guess who the competitor is, right? So Gabrielle is going to be trying to do it. And don't cheat. Don't look at their comments because they, they might play the game better than you. Okay. But it anyway, beats me every time when we do this game. All okay. right. So we're going to start 20 questions. I have a competitor in mind right now. Okay. Is it a female competitor? Yes. Okay. Was she ever on Team Paul Mitchell? Yes. Is it Haley Glass? No. <laughs> Is it Avery Presley? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so four <laughs> questions in. Gabrielle has won 20 questions for the first time. That has never happened. In the history of our relationship. But obviously, that was kind of an easy one. Okay. Can, can we play one more time and I give you a little bit harder? That's not, let me enjoy this win. You want okay, me to just fine. let you enjoy okay, the win? Okay, fine. You wanted four questions. This isn't entertaining. Okay. Okay. Fine, let's go again. All right, I'm gonna, this is going to challenge the audience a little bit more as well. Let me think. Who am I going to pick? Who am I going to pick? I. Okay. I've got it. Is it a female competitor? No. So it's a no. Okay. Okay. Yes. <laughs> is, is that a question? <laughs> no. Is it a junior? 
no. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, at one point. <laughs> so it's an adult male competitor. Yes. Is it a CMX competitor? No. Okay. So it's a traditional. <laughs> I saw that nod. That means yes. Cool. I didn't nod. You. I did not nod. You gave one of these. It will lead you astray if you think it's a okay, traditional. Okay, is it competitor. a traditional form competitor? No. <laughs> Wait, it's not a CMX. Oh, it's a fighter. Oh no. Is it a fighter? Yes. He's a fighter. Oh. Fifteen more questions. Uh, and then again, y'all in the comments, feel free, she's probably going to need help, so y'all help her. Okay. Oh. You know, you know who this is. Okay. You Does know who this is. Did he compete on Team Paul Mitchell? He did. He's competing now? No. I told you this one was harder. So it's not an active competitor? No. Oh gosh, this is very hard for me. Is it Cam Dawson? No. Good guess. Though. Is it a Hungarian? No. Oh, oh, okay. We've got people guessing in the comments. So Mike Grumet also guessed Cam Dawson. It is not. Sammy wants to know if it starts with a J. Would you like to make that your question? Does it start with a J? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sammy Smith! You got 10 left. You got 10 left. Okay, I've got 10 left. <laughs> this is so hard. I'm so bad when it comes to fighters. Okay. So let me go over the facts. Retired competitor. <laughs> Male fighter. Was once on Team Paul Mitchell. Yes. I'm thinking. You got 10 more questions. I know, I've got 10 more questions. Why don't, so you're going with sport karate demographics. Why don't you try to actually figure out what this person looks like? This person tall? I'm, I'm coaching you. <laughs> yes, this person is tall. Is this person Raymond Daniels? No. Dang it! I saw my, I cheated a little bit. You looked at Mike's answer. You can't do that. Okay. The tall man um, who was on Paul Mitchell. If you don't get this. Is it Steve Babcock? It is Steve it's Babcock. It's Steve Babcock. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Let's go. So that time, see, that was more entertaining. Okay. You took more time, and that was a good one. That was good. So Steve Babcock is the answer. That was a good one. Okay, so now I've, I've been, you know, giving Gabrielle a hard time. Jeannie Jones guessed Steve. She must be on a little bit of a, de of a delay. Um, so now, Gabrielle, you have a chance to try to to try to get me. I don't know if I'm going to beat your record of four to get the answer, but I, I can okay. I can try to get it. Okay, let me let me get the. And again, even when I'm playing, like y'all, again, try to guess. If y'all beat me to it, y'all beat me to it. All right. I'm thinking of someone. I'm thinking of a really hard one. Not mm. not super hard. Okay, I've got I've got. You got one. one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, female competitor. Nope. Active competitor. Retired male competitor. Forms of weapons competitor. Yes. Retired male forms of weapons competitor. Competed within the last 10 years, within but 2012 or later. You gonna make up somebody and not know? No, I'm I'm trying to think of when his last tournament was. I would say like right at the stopping point. Like right at the cusp of <laughs> turning into that. I think that Mike Brume is correct. <laughs> Micah Collins. Yeah. Ah, I got an in five. That was pretty good. Damn. And technically, Mike Brume got an in five. That's I funny. think that Mike Brume got it before I before we even asked when he like when the last time he competed was. So Mike Brume holds the he's tied with you for the record of four now, and he's not even on the show. He's just if we have That's game if we have game night, I have a really good feeling that Mike Brume is going to be one of the contestants. <laughs> Because what I'm thinking, guys, is I'm thinking that we're going to do an application process, and then that way, like, anybody who wants to be involved in game night can, like, send in, like, here is why I want to be involved, and then I'll, I'll pick people who actually earn the right based off the application to be in the game night episode. Mm -hmm. um, so Sammy wants Sammy wants a redo. Sammy wants okay, me to play okay. again. So we're going to play one more time. I'm going to think of something. I'm thinking of someone. In the, the storm up in here. Okay, so I think the last one was a little bit too easy for you because I feel like that's, you know, come on, aka Michael Parnes. Hmm. <laughs> oh, I've got a good one. Okay. Okay. Who is it? <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, male competitor. Yep. Retired. 
retired competitor. Yes. Retired male competitor. Uh, ever on Team Paul Mitchell? No. Team AKA? Yeah. Brandon Hewitt? No. Oh, I thought I had it. Um, competed post 2010. Are have I know? have I ever competed against this competitor? Yes. Mm. Retired team AKA. Did this person retire on team AKA? Yes. It's not a Presley. Will you ask Paul Mitchell? I said no. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, thank you for that reminder. Hey, uh, was this person a bow competitor? No. Is this person Ross Constant? No. Oh! Yeah, <laughs> ten more. I really thought it was Ross Constant. I think Mike Rumay's right again. Is it Jacob Pinto? No. Ooh, okay. Is it a comma competitor? No. <laughs> is it a... There's not... Okay, Sword is Pinto and... Chucks is Ross. Is it a Chucks competitor? Yes. Is it Tony Fed? No. Nope. Oh, what? <laughs> it's not Tony Fed. Oh, a Chucks no. competitor. This is so good. Aiden Matthews. No. Mm. He still competes. Reti oh yeah, he does still. Mm. Retired Chucks competitor <laughs> that I've competed against. I feel like an idiot from Team AKA. Yeah. Andrew Norland. No. I don't think I ever competed against Andrew Norland. Why am I struggling so much? How did you do this? I just had a good... Am I going to feel stupid? Yes. <laughs> a male Chucks competitor. You said they retired on Team AKA. Mm -hmm. That I competed against. You didn't ask if AKA was their first team. I'm trying to think of people on AK that did chucks against me. Because I feel like I'm disrespecting somebody right now. I feel like there's somebody I'm competing against. It's like, he doesn't remember me. Who is this? Oh my God, Sammy Smith got it. It's Alan Davis. I forgot Alan was on AKA. Alan, Alan is a team straight up competitor. No, he's not, a team. I do not think, I know he retired at AKA, but I don't think of him as an AKA competitor because most of his career was straight up. No. That I was think tricky. It was half and half. That was tricky. It wasn't tricky. That was very tricky. No, it wasn't. That was I very won. tricky. You, I won 20 questions. You won. That was good. And I did, com did, I, did I compete against Alan? Yes. I remember when you. Was that? That's right. I did compete against Alan. Mm -hmm. Ha. You got me. Thank you. You got me. Yeah, no, I do. Well, <laughs> I'm going to end the show in defeat tonight. You really got me. I really got this, Guys, you're like, this you guys never don't understand. Happens. You don't understand. Like, Gabrielle never beats me at 20 questions, and she just beat me at karate 20 questions. Live. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. Thank you guys once again for tuning in to another episode of the Jax Rudolph Podcast. This would not be possible without you guys. And final reminder, this T-shirt can be yours. We never give out Team Paul Mitchell t-shirts. We're giving out three of them. All you got to do, go to the Paul Mitchell Karate page on Instagram. There's a picture of Ben Jones. Pose them like that. Find that picture of Ben Jones. It's got all the details of the contest. You just got to post a video of you saying what about Team Paul Mitchell inspires you and then do a martial arts combo and you've got a chance to win a Paul Mitchell t-shirt. Like I said, guys, that is a super rare opportunity. It does not happen. Thank you all so much for your participation in the show tonight. We love it when people get active in the comments and participate in these shows. We hope you had a good time. And stay tuned because after the success of 20 questions, everybody loves sport karate team roulette. Game night, that episode is going to be coming soon. Ooh. We've got we've got some guests that I want to get on the show in the next couple of weeks. But I, I can sense game night coming. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. This has been episode 112 of the Jackson Rudolph podcast. I'm Jackson Rudolph. I'm Gabrielle Rudolph. And I'll see you next time. Maybe she'll see you next time. We might see you next time. I'll definitely see you next time. <laughs> Bye, guys.